chapter forty three of the barnabys in america by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter forty three the ladies of sandusky do the honours of their town to the major he profits thereby like an extremely wise man he is rewarded for this by a happy reunion with his family at pittsburgh the narrative returns to mr egerton and records some interesting anecdotes concerning him on reaching the first good-looking hotel near the landing-place the rev mr o'donagough entered it and immediately ordered the best rooms they had especially mentioning with much solemnity the necessity of a quiet and undisturbed sitting-room in course sir replied the landlady for luckily for the major it was a landlady and not a landlord to whom he had addressed himself in course sir i know my duty to a gentleman such as you too well not to take care of that and sure enough the landlady did show them into a particular snug and quiet room at the greatest possible distance from the noisy bar and with so long a passage leading to it that it really seemed as if it had been built on purpose for seclusion having entered this room sedately one by one closed the door and listened for a minute to the briskly retreating steps of the busy landlady the major his wife and daughter simultaneously threw themselves into three chairs and forthwith indulged in such an unmitigated peal of laughter as to make the startled and perplexed tornorino look as if he thought they were all seized with a sudden fit of insanity nor did the observing this either induce or enable them to moderate their mirth but perhaps had a rather a contrary effect and no wonder for it is impossible to conceive a much more ludicrous contrast than that offered by the grave and weary-looking don and his laughter-shaken companions at length however the convulsion passed and then amidst the mutual compliments which were exchanged upon the perfect performance of the gentleman the admirably discreet forbearance of his wife together with a few gentle reproaches to patty upon her dangerous want of self-control the mystery was explained and tornorino made to understand all that had happened another gay supper followed this triumphant recital of the clever scene when it was agreed on all sides that with such an admirable talent and such brilliant success in the use of it the major owed it to himself and his family to turn it to greater profit than merely throwing dust enough in the eyes of mr gabriel monkton to puzzle him as to his identity upon my honour donny you must make these ladies pay for your preaching or i shall not be satisfied said my heroine the major looked roguishly at her in return and said i am not sure my barnaby that you may be perfectly right as to the possibility of my making these exemplary females contribute a few dollars to the expenses of this particularly pleasant journey but before you set me upon it dear wife let me beg you to remember that a good deal of sisterly and brotherly love-making must in all human probability take place before the result you anticipate can be looked for will not your fond heart feel some tender alarms my dear during your widowed residence at pittsburgh knowing that i am thus employed at sandusky this sally produced a fresh burst of laughter and mrs allen barnaby replied in admirable mock heroic unquestionably my love i shall pine and i shall languish nevertheless such is my devotion to the common cause that i will endure it all rather than risk the loss of a single dollar or gracefully suiting the action to the word forfeit a single drop of this sparkling glass of champagne it is now absolutely necessary that the narrative should retrograde a little for the purpose of affording the reader a glimpse at some of the other personages introduced in it and as my only real and legitimate heroine is at this time suspended as it were from all action while awaiting at pittsburgh the arrival of her husband from sandusky the present opportunity is particularly favourable for that purpose it is to be hoped that the kind and courteous reader remembers the position of affairs at big gang bank at the time the allen barnaby party quitted it and also the scene which followed between our young english friend egerton and his umwile hospitable entertainers the result of this was his immediately leaving the house but not the neighbourhood for as may be likewise remembered he had while uttering his farewell to his particular friend miss louisa perkins contrived to arrange an assignation with her for the evening at the house of mrs cleo whitlaw hurried as was the moment in which this arrangement was settled he had contrived to make the worthy louisa understand that this evening meeting would not be quite perfect unless the fair annie were made a part of it 
it must certainly have been owing to the experience which the elder miss perkins had gained in love matters by having been a looker-on upon the great variety of such affairs in which the heart of her sister had been concerned that she so immediately comprehended the state of the case respecting annie beauchamp and mr egerton most certain it is that they neither of them had ever breathed to her a single syllable explanatory of the state of their respective hearts and yet the worthy spinster felt as certain of their being exceedingly in love with each other as if she had been the confidant of both from the first hour of their acquaintance to the last in this respect indeed she had greatly the advantage of them for although each by this time had a pretty tolerably clear idea of the truth respecting his or her own particular heart they neither of them dared to believe that he or she had made any impression on the heart of the other but although miss louisa felt as sure as sure could be that the attachment was equal and mutual she was not such a blundering agent as to hint this belief to her young friend when she proposed to her the walk to portico lodge she did not indeed even mention the name of mr egerton and whether miss beauchamp had overheard any part of the whisper by which the arrangement was made it was impossible for miss louisa to guess for the subject was never even alluded to between them but however this may be the young lady made no objection to the proposal of the elder one and they set off arm in arm together leaving the colonel and his wife expatiating to miss matilda upon the extraordinary virtue and talent of mrs allen barnaby and the scandalous conduct of their young countryman mr egerton the two walking ladies were perhaps about equally well pleased to escape hearing this and the satisfaction of having done so brought a smile to the melancholy face of poor annie but it quickly passed away for her heart was heavy and sad and she moved on in total silence feeling that if her very life had depended upon her talking it would have been impossible the good louisa however seemed to understand all about it and walked on beside her without uttering a sound that might interrupt her pretty companion's reverie having thus reached in silence the entrance of mrs whitlaw's domain miss louisa stopped and looked about her annie coloured violently but she stopped also but it was only for an instant for as if some thought had arisen in her mind leading her to disapprove this delay she suddenly moved forward again and with a much quicker step than before but ere she reached the little gate through which they were to pass into mrs whitlaw's shrubbery frederick egerton stood before them annie beauchamp did not faint although she became as pale as alabaster and so strongly agitated was the young man also that till miss perkins broke the silence not a word was spoken she did not however watch their embarrassment long without doing her very best good soul to remove it i see how it is my dear young friends she said as plainly as if i was in both your hearts what has happened this morning is certainly very unlucky for you both but if i leave you by yourselves to talk it over i hope and trust you will think upon something or other to set it all right again egerton gave one look of gratitude to his kind ally who instantly stepped forward and then seizing the hand of annie he hastily exclaimed forgive this most involuntary abruptness dearest miss beauchamp drive me not from you as i was driven from your house this morning but believe that if my respect my reverence equalled not my love i should not thus implore you to be my wife in the only moment and in the only manner that is left me there was something it is impossible to describe what in the eyes of annie as she raised them to the face of egerton as he spoke that seemed to save him from despair though her first act except looking at him was to withdraw her hand and her first words to say if indeed you thus love me mr egerton you will instantly overtake miss perkins and bring her back to me it is possible that some young ladies might have spoken such words under similar circumstances without either intending or expecting that they would or should be obeyed but there is an intonation in the accents of truth which when heard by ears intent upon discovering the exact meaning of what they listen to cannot easily be misunderstood egerton had left the side of his beloved and had taken the hand of miss perkins in order to make her break in upon the tete-a-tete -tete, which he would have given years of life to prolong in less time perhaps than it had ever taken him before to bound over an equal space she will not listen to me my dearest miss perkins said he unless you are beside her come back with me this moment i entreat you the kind-hearted louisa did not get over the ground with precisely the same sort of flying movement that mr egerton had done but she moved as rapidly as she could towards her young friend and though in the interpretation of her feelings she had not now the advantage of any great experience from having watched similar emotions in her sister 
she seemed somehow or other to comprehend that it was possible under the peculiar circumstances of the case that poor annie might be in earnest in wishing to have her back again when the trio were thus once more reunited annie beauchamp attempted to say something which doubtless would have been very much to the purpose but she failed and instead of speaking dropped her head upon the shoulder of louisa and burst into tears poor dear child exclaimed the gentle spinster she was greatly shocked mr egerton by what took place this morning as i dare say you can guess sir pretty well and therefore you know she must not be hurried now hurried cried egerton clasping his hands and fixing his eyes upon the weeping girl with an air and manner that seemed to say he could be contented to stand thus gazing upon her for ages oh no she shall not be hurried miss perkins let her but give me hope for the future however distant and she shall see how absolute her power is over me annie raised her head and fixed her beautiful eyes all tearful as they were upon him the first overwhelming transition from doubting trembling hope to delicious certainty was over and the firm but gentle energy of annie beauchamp immediately displayed itself not for a knowledge of my sentiment shall you wait mr egerton said she i have been somewhat over prompt it may be in days past to make you fully comprehend the extent of my prejudices and i will not be afraid to let you see that strong as they were they were not so inveterate as to stand against truth honour and generosity i know nothing of your family or fortune but i know you and thus far will i profit by my american freedom i will promise you mr egerton never to be the wife of any other man so long as it shall continue to be your wish that i should become yours nay nay you must not thank me thus vehemently she added as he seized her hand and covered it with kisses for it may be that all i have said and all i have the power to say shall mean nothing more than the expression of my gratitude for sentiments so dearly valued that were my mother and father willing i would not deem my whole life too long a space to be employed in proving how very precious they are to me but alas mr egerton how can we hope after what has passed this morning that i can never be your wife without ceasing to be their child in this at once and for ever let me declare to you i never will do i will not give you as a companion for life a guilty daughter whose remorse would grow more bitter every day she lived this i will never do nor will i ever ask it of you annie replied egerton with sincerity equal to her own i could not love you as i do did i not in my very soul believe that you are as good as you are beautiful but dearest i do not despair of obtaining the consent of colonel beauchamp and even of your mother annie angry as she is with me at this moment i have romance enough about me i confess to rejoice at having heard the precious words you have uttered while you were still ignorant of my fortune and position in the world and as those dear words are recorded where they will endure as long as life and memory are lent me i may now tell you freely that my estate and the settlement i shall propose to your father are not such as to offer a reason for his rejecting me my family is honourable and very nobly connected and what i think will weigh far more with you dearest annie than either i flatter myself i can refer with honest confidence to the guardians who have had charge of me from the death of my father to the time of my coming of age as well as to eton and oxford where i received my education for testimony that my actions have hitherto brought no disgrace upon my name ah mr egerton returned annie with both a sigh and a smile all this would have gone very far yesterday towards obtaining such an answer as you wish but i fear that as yet you have no idea of the anger conceived against you both for your unfortunate parley with the slaves in the rice grounds and your accusations against the husband of that terrible mrs barnaby indeed indeed i fear that you would not be listened to upon such a subject for a single instant neither will i venture to ask it dearest annie he replied i feel perfectly certain of being able to bring evidence of the truth of all i have said respecting this major and if i do so my motives for having warned your father of his practices must surely be justly appreciated and as to the other offence imputed to me a very short time must surely suffice to prove that i have at least done nothing productive of any mischievous result you speak so hopefully mr egerton she replied that you make me think you must know better about it all than i do but you will allow that time must be given both for your inquiry about the major and for the negative proof of your innocence respecting the poor slaves 
but this last imputation will i doubt not die away if they all remain quiet and time shall be patiently given by me sweet annie provided you promise that i may now and then hear from you of course i shall leave this place to-night as it certainly would look like plotting and planning mischief were i to be found lurking here after the scene of this morning how i bless the speaking paleness of your fair face dearest which gave me the courage to ask our kind friend here for this interview how different will be my departure now from what in that first dreadful moment i feared it would have been and you will write to me annie first addressed to the post-office at new york for it is thither as i understand that my precious countryman has taken himself and it is thither that i shall immediately follow but you will write to me and promise to receive my letters in return annie looked in the face of miss perkins and would at that moment have given a good deal if the kind feeling she so plainly saw written there had been more mingled with the tougher quality of good sense poor girl she longed for an english opinion that might have been trusted as to the propriety of complying with the request of egerton to refuse him seemed almost beyond her strength yet conscious of her total ignorance of english etiquette in such matters she shrunk from the idea of consenting to do what was unusual egerton saw the struggle and understood it are you not my affianced wife annie conditionally it is true but still you are pledged to me and am i not still more your affianced husband for i have offered my vows unshackled by any condition whatever think you then that i would ask you to do anything that i would not sanction in my own sister were i happy enough to have one i will write to you said annie gently if you desire me to do it and will you receive my letters dearest he rejoined after once again fervently kissing her hand yes mr egerton i will she replied with something almost approaching to solemnity in her manner but in both cases it must be done by the assistance of miss perkins for it must not be from me that my parents first learn what has passed between us it will easily be believed that the good louisa raised no difficulties upon this point and frederick egerton looked quite as happy as it was possible for a man to do who was on the very eve of parting with his beloved all this had passed in a shady and obscure retreat in a rustic summer-house at no great distance from the entrance to mrs whitlaw's grounds into which annie who knew it well had almost unconsciously entered immediately after miss perkins had rejoined her and now she rose to leave it saying to that excellent person as she did so i cannot visit mrs whitlaw now miss louisa i should not comprehend a single word she said to me farewell mr egerton and she held out her hand to him farewell before this sad word was uttered between them for the last time the eyes of the whole party bore witness that they did not separate with indifference for on seeing the emotion of her young friends the tender-hearted louisa wept for company but part they must and part they did at last but not till the lovers had confessed to each other that despite the obstacles which thus drove them asunder that hour was the happiest of their lives End of chapter forty three Chapter forty four of the Barnabys in America by Francis Milton Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter forty four. The major's versatile powers are shown to great advantage. Patty displays an affectionate heart. Mr. Egerton takes a very long journey to very little purpose, but comes to a safe harbor at last. So very little space is left for detailing the last scenes of the Barnabys in America that they must needs be passed over very lightly. It is hardly necessary, after what the reader knows already, to state that the reception of the Reverend Mr. O'Donagough at Mount Lebanon was everything his heart could wish. Young ladies and old, brown ladies and fair, all vied with each other how they best might prove their reverence for his character and admiration for his talents it is true that the gentlemen of sandusky did not put themselves to much trouble to do the honours of the town to the industrious major but neither did they on the other hand at all interfere to check the hospitalities of the ladies so that the time he remained there he might truly be said to have been living in clover it must be remembered however that major allen barnaby though for particular reasons alone at sandusky was not alone in the world at any rate he himself never forgot that he had a wife and daughter whose worldly welfare depended as much upon his exertions in one way as the unworldly welfare of the serious ladies of the lake did in another 
and it therefore happened as all persons blessed with an acute perception of character must have foreseen that he had not remained many days amongst them before he made it understood that the hand of fortune had been as penurious to him as that of nature had been bountiful were this chapter of his adventures at the beginning of the first volume instead of being at the end of the third i might be tempted to describe at some length the various ways in which his conjugal and paternal affections acted as siphons upon the female pockets of this amiable inland sea population but the time is past for this and i must therefore content myself with stating that for nearly a month the rev mr o'donagough lived upon the fattest fat of the sandusky land and that seldom a day passed during this period without adding a dollar or two on some pretence or other to his resources the liberality of mrs general pedmington indeed was not restrained to such little offerings as these for ere he parted she presented her new friend with five hundred dollars for the embellishment of his humble chapel in england upon condition affectionately expressed and fully understood that he should revisit mount lebanon before his departure for the old country it was not perhaps the least agreeable feature of this delightful month that the major during the course of it had the singular gratification of hearing himself perpetually talked of described and condemned to all sorts of pains and penalties as one of the most audacious swindlers that ever ventured to poach on the native preserves of the union while he sat tranquilly by uttering an occasional alas at the strange depravity of human nature at length however some feelings of weariness began to creep like a mildew over the delights of the mount lebanon reunions not indeed among the charming society to its manners born but to the stranger who had first to learn their ways and then to adopt them it was amidst showers of tears that the sisters of the needle steeple congregation took their last reluctant leave of the gentle major and the judicious tenderness with which he graduated his farewell benedictions to them all had in it a delicacy of tact that upon recollection positively surprised himself and caused him to exclaim as so many have done before him no man knows what he is capable of performing till he tries can it be doubted that the meeting with his family at pittsburgh was delightful or that mrs allen barnaby was rewarded with more than one glass of her favourite wine for having so long and so patiently endured the absence of her beloved husband and at pittsburgh as before decided they took into consideration the comparative advantages of risking returning for a few days to new orleans or its neighbourhood which could be done with perfect convenience by water or of travelling across the allegheny mountains to baltimore for the purpose of embarking for europe against the first there was the danger of the major's being recognized as the hero of the big gang bank festivities against the last was the expense and fatigue of a long land journey with the doubt whether the major would be much safer there than at new orleans patty whose fears from discovery were of a considerably graver nature than those of the rest of the party protested strongly against returning to new orleans declaring that though pap did sometimes put her in dreadful passions by being so stingy of his money to her and the don she did not want to have him hanged few ladies on the whole could be less victims of delicate sensibility than my beautiful bride yet nevertheless she now exhibited considerable feeling for upon her mother saying that she thought they would be all safe at new orleans if they did but take a little care and put up at the further end of the town for mrs carmichael's boarding-house she burst out upon her with great vehemence and declared that she believed in her heart that she was looking forward to being a widow again and making conquests the major was a good deal touched by this testimony of his daughter's affection but being himself very strongly in favour of the new orleans scheme he told her after a hearty hug that he was excessively obliged to her for her kindness and that the fear of vexing her if anything went wrong with him would be as likely to make him careful as the dread of the gallows itself but if you could have seen me at mount lebanon my darling you would have been cured at once and for ever of all fears on my account i really did not know my own powers before patty but now i declare to you upon my word and honour i would rather have the fun of bamboozling the natives than not i would venture to bet five thousand to one against any one of those we saw at new orleans knowing me again if i did not choose they should do so besides my dear i have another word to say in favour of the new orleans plan i heard from many people while i was at sandusky that it would be a sin and a shame to leave the country without spending a few weeks at natchez which for pleasant amusements and all that and here the major gave a sidelong glance of intelligence to his wife and the don is quite new orleans in miniature and moreover by reposing ourselves there for a little while 
it would be easy enough to leave when there was a good vessel going to start for havre and our places might be easily secured on board her without our ever making our appearance in the city till the very day she set off i vote therefore for our making our way by the ohio and the mississippi to natchez and remaining exactly as long as we find it agreeable and not an hour longer this scheme seemed to satisfy all parties and was accordingly acted upon forthwith the long river voyage was performed with much less tediousness than any of them expected for the major and his son-in-law scarcely ever passed an idle hour while they were on board nor one that was not more or less profitable for this long line of river travelling is as remarkable for its industrious gambling as for any other of its agreeable features as to mrs allen barnaby and patty they found means to amuse themselves exceedingly well though they played neither at whist nor piquet there were several ladies on board who by asking them day after day incessant questions respecting themselves gave them both such an opportunity of vapouring about their european grandeur as kept them in perpetual good humour so that they all arrived at natchez in excellent spirits and ready to meet whatever adventures might chance to befall them there with sharp wits and sturdy courage it took but little time to convince major allen barnaby that the information he had received respecting the social and intellectual advancement of the population of this flourishing little town was perfectly correct it realized all his hopes and exceeded all his expectations so that for rather more than two months that the party remained he had scarcely a single misadventure or disappointment of any kind to recount to his faithful wife this steady current of good fortune however only served in the long run to convince him that with his talents and advantages his son-in-law ranking higher and higher every day among the latter he could not do himself justice while carrying on business in so small a way his high-minded wife also was most decidedly of the same opinion and being moreover as well as her daughter heartily tired of the town and everything in it the feminine influence of the family was put forth with considerable activity while even the peaceable tornorino though exceedingly well pleased by a few well-timed donations from his father-in-law began to hint now and then in a gentle murmur that the vin was not very good in a word their speedy departure was fixed and decided upon a certain evening when little or nothing had been done at the usual place of meeting and on the following morning the major started alone for new orleans by an early steamboat intending to disembark a mile or two above the town and to proceed early on the following morning direct to the quays where the large vessels bound to europe were sure to be found the costume he assumed for this expedition was that of the rev mr o'donagough over which on leaving his lodging he threw a large cloak to prevent any observations from his neighbours and quietly walked on board in all outward respects so utterly unlike the military gentleman who had figured as an east indian of a large fortune during his residence at natchez that there was certainly very little chance of his being recognised while he is prosperously borne by tide and steam towards the place of his destination we will rapidly follow the fortunes of mr egerton from the time he left the side of annie beauchamp in pursuit of him in the first instance he proceeded in consequence of the information he had received to new york and devoted himself most indefatigably to the task of discovering if any such personage as major allen barnaby was to be found there not a single hotel boarding or lodging-house of tolerable respectability was left unquestioned and such was the zeal and perseverance of his perquisition that had the major been in the city he could scarcely have escaped it but during the days thus employed our major and his family were as the reader well knows at philadelphia being at length reluctantly convinced that no major allen barnaby was to be found there mr egerton returned to new orleans convinced that he had begun his search very unadvisedly in taking it for granted that his slippery countryman was likely to be found where he said he should be and determined for the future to trace him step by step on surer evidence than his own word he ventured not however to present himself at big gang bank but obtained from his fair correspondent there all the particulars she could gather from the slaves who had attended upon the allen barnaby party as to the place to which they had conducted them to this place he immediately repaired but though the party as described by him were perfectly well remembered at the principal hotel there he found it impossible to ascertain with certainty whither they went afterwards most of the people of the house declaring that they went to new york while one or two porters positively stated that their luggage was put on board a vessel going to philadelphia 
in this dilemma the young man had recourse to his own judgment as to which was most probable and although he had already satisfactorily convinced himself that in the first instance he certainly did not go to new york he still thought his chance of finding him would be better if he again returned to that city in the hope of his having visited it subsequently than waste his time in troubling by going to philadelphia knowing enough of the style of its society to be convinced that if the object of his search had really been there he did not stay long to new york therefore he again repaired but not till major allen barnaby had left it about four-and-twenty hours but though he found not him he found enough concerning him to add proof to conviction as to his character for here chance favoured him by sending him upon his arrival to the same house in which the illustrious english family had boarded and his very first inquiry brought forth from the party at the dinner-table where it was made the most violent burst of indignation against the major who was declared by the whole company to be the most atrocious swindler that ever lived beyond this however he gained little information sufficiently authentic to be of any use to him he had been traced to the springs they said and clearly recognized as the suspicious individual to whom mr gabriel monkton had devoted so much attention but beyond the deck of the steamboat all trace of him was lost and that how when and where he got on shore no one knew or notwithstanding the national propensity could even venture to guess mr monkton had declared that he had himself watched every passenger that had left the boat both at cleveland and at sandusky and that major allen barnaby was most certainly not amongst them it was however the general opinion of the whole party that he had escaped the very active pursuit after him by travelling pretty considerable far west such being as they said the universal custom of all the gentry who had made the old states too hot to hold them the evident probability that this was the fact was a severe disappointment to poor egerton who had hoped to return to the house of colonel beauchamp with such confirmation of his statement respecting the major as might have restored the confidence and friendly feeling of himself and wife in greatly less time than it would take him to reach the far west and obtain such legal confirmation of what he had asserted as could admit of no contradiction or evasion the news he had of the runaway at new york was however such as very satisfactorily to strengthen his hopes of obtaining this could he overtake him and he therefore once more set forth with no other guide than what was furnished by a list of the various towns through which he was likely to pass or where he might have been tempted to tarry this very laborious expedition however proved entirely abortive and at length weary and desponding he gave up the chase and determined upon returning with all speed to new orleans where annie's letters informed him the family would soon be settled for the winter with no better proof of what he had stated than the reports he had heard at new york harassed and out of spirits egerton was traversing the galley-walk of the steamboat that was taking him his last day's voyage towards the place of his destination when the boat stopped to take in wood and passengers at natchez the young man was in no very speculative humour and though he listlessly bent over the rail as if to watch the comers and goers he in reality paid but little attention to any of them there was one figure however which notwithstanding his abstraction drew his attention and fixed it this was a peculiarly nice-looking elderly gentleman dressed in black whose sole dress and aspect declared him to be of the clerical profession and whose remarkable quietness of demeanour offered a strong contrast to the half-horse half-alligator population of which the passengers were almost entirely composed this venerable personage entered the vessel and moved onward without looking either to the right or to the left and in doing so passed so close to mr egerton but without seeing him the profile of this respectable gentleman struck egerton as being very like that of some individual whom he had seen he knew not where or when and he followed him with a sort of curiosity which this imperfect kind of recollection always produces when the stranger reached the gallery in front of the great cabin he seated himself for a moment on a sofa that was placed there and with his hands rather formally crossed upon his breast lifted his mild eyes and looked about him in this circular glance he caught sight of mr egerton and in doing so started evidently at least to the young man himself whose eye was fixed upon him but not sufficiently to attract the attention of any other person this involuntary movement on the part of the respectable gentleman in black naturally attracted a more scrutinizing glance from egerton in return and then though the reverend personage was moving away and that a portion only of his face was visible he instantly became convinced that he saw before him the man he was seeking his own mode of proceeding was immediately decided on 
the start and the sudden departure showed him both that he was recognized and avoided and he determined while strictly keeping watch over him that he would show no symptom of recollecting their having met before at the dinner-table the black-coated gentleman took his place with the rest of the company but egerton while taking care to look around him with an equal air of indifference upon them all was aware that his looks words and gestures were carefully watched by the stranger he felt certain if his ci devant acquaintance perceived that he was known in spite of his disguise he would bolt at the first station at which the boat should stop to take in wood for the engine but so well did he contrive to look at the man as if he had never seen him before that our major for most surely it was himself became perfectly reassured and fully confirmed in the agreeable conviction that when he chose to disguise himself nobody could find him out the reverend mr o'donagough therefore it was thus that his carpet-bag was labelled continued his voyage to new orleans with no further precaution than taking care not to speak within hearing of mr egerton lest his ear might prove more discerning than his eye it was as dark as an american night could well be when they reached new orleans and egerton aware that it would be impossible to watch his suspicious fellow-traveller without following him too closely to avoid being watched in his turn very cleverly enlisted in his service a negro lad who had charge of a neatly ornamented bird-cage containing a fine mocking-bird to whom during many hours of the day he had been teaching various tunes this rather amusing occupation first caused mr egerton to notice him and the sable youth giving sundry indications of sharp-wittedness in his answers it struck him that a dollar might be well bestowed in securing his services as a spy the offer was promptly made and promptly accepted the rev mr o'donagough paid no attention whatever to the young slave in his bird-cage who having seen the parson gentleman safely housed at an obscure inn returned swiftly to his employer who was awaiting him at a well-known hotel near the landing-place the diligence and intelligence of the lad induced egerton to inquire if he could serve him further and he was readily answered in the affirmative the young slave stating that he was the property of a pretty young lady who was very good-natured and would not scold him even if he did stay out of the house a bit now and then no arrangement could be more favourable for his purpose as no agent could be employed less likely to excite suspicion and accordingly having paid him in a style very effectually to answer his zealous services he made the youth understand enough of his object to render them available and then repaired to the post-office where according to promise he found a letter from annie she told him that their removal to new orleans was postponed in consequence of some plantation business which was to be completed before they left the premises but that she thought he might venture to pay them a visit if he wished it as both her father and mother had first become affronted and then suspicious in consequence of never having received a single line from their dear friend mrs allen barnaby from the time she had left them moreover their far-off neighbour mr hapford having at length recovered from a violent fit of the gout had been at the bank and declared his conviction of having been cheated at play by the whiskered englishman whom he had met there at his last visit all this as annie gently observed would greatly lessen the probability of his being rudely received if he came to visit them his fair correspondent then went on to say that she thought poor louisa perkins to whom he had always shown so much kindness was greatly in want of some friend to put her in the way of getting back to england for that though she and her sister were come again to the bank after making a circle of visits among the people who most wished to honour mrs allen barnaby it was very evident that her father and mother wanted to get rid of them and annie said she greatly feared they would not much longer delay letting them perceive this in a manner that it would greatly pain her to witness this long letter was read twice through and then egerton having kissed the signature folded the precious paper carefully and placed it like its rather numerous predecessors under the protection of a brahma lock began to meditate upon the difficult problem of how he could set off instantly to obey the summons it contained yet not lose sight of the major before he could learn a little more concerning him that of these two apparently incompatible objects the first was in his estimation the most important was proved by his instantly ringing for a waiter and dispatching him to secure a place in the next coach that left new orleans in the direction he wished to go no such conveyance however was to depart till the following morning and before he went to rest his black ally inquired for him and was shown into his room his report was as follows the parson gentleman was called the rev mr o'donagough he was going to havre wanted four first-rate berths and his family at natchez should go and fetch them in time to sail the lady anne which was the name of the vessel in which he was going was not to sail for ten days and finally 
the reverend gentleman himself had already started off again in a steamboat for natchez it was impossible any intelligence could be more agreeable if colonel beauchamp still wished for any further information respecting his late honoured guests there was time enough for the purpose before they sailed and moreover their young accuser would have the satisfaction of conveying the important intelligence that they had again thought it convenient to change their name egerton slept soundly though dreaming all night of annie and arrived without delay or accident of any kind within half an hour's walk of big gang bank it was long since frederick egerton had experienced emotions of so much happiness as at the moment he set off upon this walk the letter of annie had perhaps more of shyness and less of love than any of her former ones but he interpreted this very correctly and was certainly not the less happy for it annie fancies thought he that i am already almost in her presence and must not be spoilt by too much indulgence thus gaily thinking he went bounding on and had reached the palings that surround mrs whitlaw's property which ardently as he wished to advance with all possible speed almost induced him to stop that he might gaze upon the objects which had surrounded him when annie had first promised that she would never be the wife of another but the question whether he should pause or not was not left for him to decide for just as he reached the little gate by which he had formerly entered the premises nina the favourite slave of his beloved rushed out and seized his arm thank god mr egerton she exclaimed i have not watched for you in vain my mistress is here miss annie is here come in come in you must not go a single step farther towards the bank delighted to find that annie was so near and thinking perhaps that she had come thither and set her favourite to watch for him that she might give him some word of advice or instruction before he saw her parents egerton followed the rapidly retreating figure of nina till he once more found himself in the flowery portico of the good cleo's elegant abode notwithstanding the advanced season the windows were open and another step placed him before the eyes of annie beauchamp though the slave nina had so evidently expected him it was equally plain that her young mistress did not for the agitation of annie was for a moment too great to permit her speaking but tears of emotion were blended with smiles of happiness as she yielded her beautiful hand to his caresses almost without a struggle when at length she found her voice she exclaimed how can it be that i see you here mr egerton i confess i have been hoping for your arrival at the bank for two days past but what has made you come here have you seen my father i am right down glad he is here annie interrupted mrs whitlaw cordially offering her hand to egerton i saw how it was going on with his heart when he was here before and what could he do better annie than come here to meet you and tell you all about it perhaps you know my dear he may not be that much at his ease with madame beauchamp and the colonel as he might be with you and i egerton related his meeting with nina at the gate and whispered to annie that she confessed she was waiting for him silly girl exclaimed the young lady blushing i dare say she knew that i was expecting you but most surely i never told her to waylay you in this strange style mr egerton let not the kind zeal in my service bring reproof on her he replied laughing i shall remember it with gratitude my annie as long as i live a very interesting conversation then followed in which mr egerton narrated his discovery of the disguised major on board the steamboat which annie assured him would be more than sufficient to convince her father and mother that he was indeed all that they had been so kindly warned to expect they should find him and then followed a discussion in which mrs whitlaw joined as to the best mode of mr egerton's presenting himself should he accompany annie home should annie precede him or should he precede her she declared that she had not courage to announce his approach and it was at length agreed that he should proceed to the bank alone endeavour to see both her parents inform them of all he had learned concerning major allen barnaby and then venture to ask if they considered this as proof sufficient of his being a man of honour if the answer was favourable he was to go on to express all his hopes and ask their consent to his wishes having received the sanction of annie and her affectionate friend for this he left them and had already again reached the little gate which opened from the lawn and which was not within sight of the house when once more he was met by nina he had observed that she looked hurried and agitated when he first met her but she was now infinitely more so and when she found from the direction he took and the words he said 
that he was hastening to colonel beauchamp's house she threw herself on the ground before him and with tears and sobs implored him to go back no room is left me to describe at length the scene which followed finding that nothing she could say could dissuade egerton from executing the plan which had been sanctioned by annie she uttered a groan that made him shudder and exclaimed then i must break my oath and sacrifice my life for her and what is dearer to her than herself if you go to my master's house young gentleman you will be murdered even after this it was some time before the terrified and reluctant girl could be made to explain herself fully but at length she confessed amid sobs and groans that the slaves on the colonel's property and that of the neighbouring plantation which belonged to judge johnson were in revolt and stood bound by tremendous oath to murder every white person of whatever age or sex that should come across them while in the act of securing whatever portable property of value they could find in either mansion they had arranged she said to escape to the numberless hiding-places known to them in the neighbouring forests where they could long subsist upon the food they meant to carry with them and expected finally to get off by means of the money of which they expected to get possession and because no one would be left alive in either estate to pursue them to the execution of this wild and horrible project they had all engaged themselves by the most solemn vows and rather would they fail and die cried the girl than live to endure more years of misery egerton's first object was to restore the agitated nina to such a degree of composure as might enable her to tell him how long this scene of horror had been in action and where she imagined her master and mistress to be at length he learned from her but not without considerable difficulty that when the oath was first proposed to her she refused to take it but was told that if she persevered in this she would be kidnapped away and kept a close prisoner till it was all over she then took it but with the understanding after long battling for it that she might save the white females if she could but that if she attempted to save the life of a white man she would herself be murdered she told him also that after prevailing on miss annie to pay a visit to mrs whitlaw she had got mrs beauchamp and the miss perkinses into the dairy-house under pretence that miss annie wanted to show them something there and that having previously secured the windows she had locked them in and then ran away egerton's first thought after hearing this terrifying statement was concerning the safety of annie he told the trembling slave to fear nothing but carefully to watch her young mistress and if she attempted to leave her present shelter to tell mrs whitlaw the whole truth that she might restrain her even by force if necessary he then obtained the key of the dairy-house the situation of which he well knew determined that his first object should be the conveying the ladies confined in it to mrs whitlaw's and then to trust to being recognized as an englishman while he risked a visit to colonel beauchamp's house in the faint hope of saving its wretched master light of foot firm in nerve and steadfast in purpose he lost no moment after deciding what to do he found the three ladies in a state of dreadful alarm for no sooner did mrs beauchamp discover that they were prisoners than she guessed the truth for by an infatuation difficult to comprehend the lives of the planters seemed pretty equally divided between tyrannizing over their slaves and trembling at the chance of their taking vengeance for it very few words passed between them egerton saying in that tone of decision which at such moments is all-powerful mrs beauchamp give me your arm follow us closely miss perkins with your sister i will take you to a place of safety where you will find miss beauchamp and then i will seek the colonel not a word was uttered in reply nothing i believe silences talkers effectually but terror and seasickness it was the wish and will of egerton that they should walk quickly but they had no other difficulty to contend with for the negroes were too busy at their work of pillage to be at many yards distance from the house on reaching the friendly abode of the good cleo they found that nina in her restless anxiety had already told both her and annie all she had previously told egerton the delight of annie at seeing her mother in safety may be imagined nor is it needful to dwell upon the amount of her gratitude to egerton but dreadful was the combat at her heart when she saw him about to plunge into danger so dreadfully certain in the desperate hope of saving her unhappy father yet could she bid him to stay it was impossible fortunately perhaps for her reason the interval of suspense was very short on leaving the house he met one of mrs whitlaw's domestic blacks her slaves though much too well treated too lazy and too happy to join in the insurrection were still negroes and as such most ardently interested in the success of their less happy fellow-slaves 
the man was returning from the scene of outrage and seeing egerton whom he remembered as an english visitor hurrying towards it he civilly stopped him and begged him to return colonel beauchamp said the panting egerton he has been dead this hour sir returned the negro casting down his eyes but very nearly smiling at the same moment and judge johnson he added in the same respectful tone has been done for longer still it is needless to dwell on the scenes which followed mrs whitlaw assured her agitated neighbours that they were now in no danger but that as their former residence would offer a scene too painful for them to look upon their best course would be to accept the loan of her carriage and horses and set off for new orleans or perhaps for new york directly for england dearest mrs beauchamp exclaimed egerton accept from me the duty the affection the protection of a son and let me accompany you to england all that was likely to make this scheme appear desirable to the agitated widow was soon explained to her the misses perkins seemed ready to take upon themselves the duties of the slave she had lost so they might be permitted to accompany her and in short for short it now must be everything concerning what they left behind was consigned to the management of the friendly and prosperous clio and within twenty-four hours after egerton's arrival he was on the road back to new orleans escorting his annie her mother his two countrywomen and the faithful nina to that city the tide had reached the point at which it is most favourable for vessels to work down the river from new orleans to the belize and egerton with the party of females above enumerated were waiting on the noble wharf for the arrangement of the ladder which was to assist them to get on board two fine vessels were at that moment preparing to depart for europe and the part of the wharf near which they both lay was crowded with spectators in the midst of this crowd was a group less quiet and less sad-looking than their own and which presently roused their attention by suddenly approaching them my dearest mrs beauchamp exclaimed my bold-hearted heroine too secure of an immediate retreat to be afraid of anything goodness me if there isn't the perkinses cried patty clapping her hands my dear ladies our ladder is ready said the major still enacting the character of the rev mr o'donagough and presenting his arm to his wife tornorino performed the same duty to his and the whole party brushed by mr egerton and his friends none of whom gave a look or uttered a word of recognition and mounted with every appearance of glee the lovely anna bound for home the party bound for england were also on board in a few minutes and the two vessels followed each other closely down the river the navigation of which though slow was perfectly prosperous and patty amused herself most delightfully during nearly the whole time it lasted by peeping at her old friends through a telescope and proclaiming their quizzical looks to every one who would listen to her the ingratitude of these perkinses is perfectly disgusting said mrs allen barnaby with a shrug heaven knows where they are all bundling to she added but there is one thing you must promise me my dearest donny and it is that if we ever have the misfortune of falling in with any of that horridly vulgar set on the continent you will look at one and all of them as if you had never set eyes on them before end of chapter forty four end of the barnabys in america by francis milton trollope recorded by celine Major.